Hello, everybody. Welcome to BSAP. We, uh, we want to thank you first off for being flexible with the unexpected circumstances, but still excited nonetheless for you to begin your education journey in mountaineering. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I took BSAP in 2012. Um, if you can believe it or not, I was once terrified of rock climbing and um, yeah, now I'm here. I love it. Addicted to climbing, been taking classes with the Mazamas ever since, and I'm super excited to share my love of rock climbing with you. I'm Kaylin. I actually didn't take the Mazamas BSEP class, but I took a similar basic climbing program with the Bellingham Mountaineers in Washington State, also in 2012, um, and have been climbing ever since. Of course, during the Mazamas when I came down here in 2014, um, taking ICS, which is another program you can take after BSEP, and have been involved since then. So we're going to get started with some desired outcomes. And we have desired outcomes for you for this class and specifically for the rock module. Um, but uh, uh, we understand like you guys have different experience coming into this. And because this is a basic program, we're going to teach as if you have no experience. So for those of you that do have experience, first we'd like you to learn the way that the Mazamas do things because there are specific ways that we do things um, and you'll be asked to uh, repeat those, but feel free to ask questions about why we do things the way we do and how it might be different from what you're used to. And then if you feel like you have your skills down, think about helping out your peers because teaching skills to your peers can um, solidify them for you and also make the experience uh, different and enjoyable for your peers since they're not just learning from instructors. So with that, here are our desired outcomes for this presentation. The goal is to set you up for success in uh, the Mazama's BSEP class overall, um, but specifically for the rock module, your sessions at Horse Thief and the MMC. And this is what we're going to cover this evening. We're going to start with pre-climb information, which we've broken down into tools and terrain. Then we'll get into the climbing skills of um, top rope belay, fixed line travel, and rappelling. We'll touch on some fundamentals of climbing and uh, have some resources for you to look back on at the end. Obviously, this is uh, not quite how we imagined it anyway, but um, so you won't be able to ask questions during the presentation, but even uh, so, we'd like you to follow along, take notes if you do have questions, and then when you meet in your small groups, um, ask them then or contact your instructor some other way. All right, pre-climb information. So we broke this down into tools, things that we use to keep us safe and terrain the place where we use those tools. We will start with tools. This is a lot of gear and equipment that you'll learn to manipulate. You may reference books or other resources uh, to get a baseline on what these tools do and maybe how to use them. And there might be a lot of rope memorization, like doing knots um, over and over again. So we need you to get those sort of fundamentals down. Um, but we want you to also use your brain and start thinking about um, why you're doing things a certain way and how that might be applied in the future in some of these bigger skills that we're doing later. So we'll start with the gear that hopefully you've already purchased or will purchase soon. This is what is required for the BSEP course. A couple things to note. Um, number four, the tubular style belay device is what we'll be using for this course. If you have experience with a different type of device, um, that's great, but for this class, we will be using the tubular style belay device. Number six, the cordage. Um, if you haven't already, that will be cut into uh, different pieces, different lengths, one for an auto block, which we'll talk about later um, in repelling, and um, one for Pressix, which we'll talk about in fixed line travel. The other thing to note here is that uh, number five, the sling, the nylon sling, will be used for your personal protection. It's a really important piece of equipment that you will be use, uh, using to clip into an anchor, another word that we'll talk about later, um, when you're up off the ground or in a climb. 
So here's a little bit more information about that personal protection leash. You'll learn to tie this with your um, team, uh, but this can be a reference for how you do that. You'll use uh, your harness, the two hard points is what we call them, um, on your belay device, and uh, that's how it connects to your harness, and then you'll connect the other end to that anchor. Next we have gear that you aren't required to own, uh, but you might see other people using in the course. And um, the point here is really just to ask questions. A lot of instructors have specific gear that they use, um, and they have reasons behind that. And I think they'd be happy to share with you um, why they do. So for example, I have a hollow block for my auto block. Um, it's a piece of gear that I really prefer to use. And you can experiment with your own. You'll start with the cordage, um, but you can potentially use this in the future as well. We won't be using um, any other belay devices. Again, as mentioned, just the tubular belay device. There is a gree-gree on the screen there. Um, you might see other people using it, and you can ask about it. But for uh, testing and what, whatnot in this class, we'll just use the tubular style devices. All right, so ropes. Um, this is something that you'll use a lot of. You won't have your own, uh, but we hope that you would treat the ropes that you use with care, that you um, think of them as your own, because even though you don't own them, um, your life really depends on them when you're using them out on, on the climbs or um, at Horse Thief or at the rock walls. Um, you want to make sure not to step on them unnecessarily and try and keep them off the ground. So that's why Randy here has all of those ropes on her. Uh, she's demonstrating great um, care technique, essentially. <laughs> um, one thing that I think people often uh, misunderstand, I know I certainly did when I first started, um, ropes do sometimes end up on the ground when you're um, outside and climbing, but you wanna keep them off the ground as much as possible, and especially in parking lots. There'll be times when you meet with your teams, you have a bunch of different ropes, and you think, oh, I'll just put it on the ground here, but um, there's oils and chemicals, especially from cars, that can not only dirty the ropes, but chemically damage them. Uh, so trying to minimize the uh, negative effect that you have is gonna be great. Uh, the other portion that you'll learn here is uh, how to coil a rope. And coiling the, ro coiling the rope is just how we try to uh, transfer, safely transfer the ropes and avoid getting kinks or um, knots in the rope and making it easier to get the rope ready to climb. We talk about using a butterfly coil, which just refers to the shape of um, the two wings, almost, of the rope. And how you finish the coil um, might vary. So backpack coil is on the bottom, um, or backpack finish. And um, I'm not sure of the name of the upper one, but that's another way that you might learn to uh, contain the rope. Now Steph is going to talk about some other things that you'll do with the rope, like tying knots and hitches. Okay, so a very important tool for this class is gonna be knots. And I'm sure you're familiar with knots and you, you know, but it's essentially used to join two ropes together, a rope to itself. We have a whole bunch of them that what you want, we want you to learn for this class. I'll highlight a few that you uh, will be covering later on in this lecture. So first here on the slide we have overhands and a double fisherman's and a figure eight follow through, which you will be learning more about in a little bit. We also have hitches, which is a little bit different than a knot because it is joined to another object like a rope or a carabiner. You just were introduced to the girth hitch when you were learning about putting your personal protection leash on your harness. We will also be covering the clove, the Prusik hitch, and the auto block later on in the lecture. Here is another word that you may be unfamiliar with. It's a bite. And a bite refers to a section of the rope, curved section. And we will be talking about this a lot when we are teaching you to set up your belay device and your rappel device. And it can also have knots on it, like the figure eight on a bite. 
and that we won't talk about that a lot today, but that's something you're going to encounter more next week in the snow lecture. So make sure that you guys practice these the next time you get together with your team, with you're out on a hike or at the MMC, you should be able to do these with your eyes closed. We want you to really get these down. Another tool that you will encounter that you may not be familiar with is anchors. I'm sure you've heard the word anchor before, but this is quite different than what I'm sure you're imagining. In climbing, we use an anchor as a device or a method for attaching ourselves or our rope to whatever surface we're climbing on. In this course, since it's a beginning class, we won't necessarily be getting into teaching you how to build these anchors, but since it's the beginning of your education, we want you to start learning to look at them, to see you know, what they look like, how they're used, you know, start getting that in, and you know, if you have questions about them, feel free to ask. All of your instructors and assistants are highly educated and would um, be happy to share with you. But, a couple that you will encounter in the class are traditional gear anchors. That's when you put something in the wall and then you later remove it. Another, another type is the fixed gear anchor, which if you've been to a crag or at the gym, you've seen the bolts in the wall. We use those for anchors and then we use natural protection anchors, which are, which are usually slung trees or often boulders. So the anatomy of an anchor, we refer to those points where there would either be a bolt or a gear as the anchor point, and then you have the legs of your anchor, and it comes down to create the master point. So, what I want you guys to really get the hang of is that you need to know how to attach yourself to the anchor and where to attach yourself to the anchor in order to be safe. So there are two ways to attach yourself to the anchor. One is using that personal protection leash that you just learned how to set up, and also with a clove hitch. So there's that knot coming up again. And there are two places where you can put these points of protection. One is in the master point, which I have an arrow pointing to, and then the other is the shelf. Now the shelf is just one strand from each leg of the anchor, and you can put either one there, and you will get a lot of practice with this. This is something that you're gonna need to go through, you know, and figure it out and just have repetition, but you will use it a lot, and that's that for anchors. So another thing we just wanna mention before we get too far in the weeds with all this climbing stuff is there are a lot of weird sounding words in the climbing community in this sport. Words you've probably never heard before, and if you just were listening from the outside, you'd think we sounded quite silly. So please just ask, ask a lot of questions. Your instructors are a wealth of knowledge, and there's never a such thing as too many questions. So if you hear something funny or different, please ask. And another way that we will use communication has to do with safety, and this is very important. The way that we communicate between each other, whether you're climbing or belaying or you're on a larger team in the mountains, we need to communicate very clearly. We need a very defined form of communication so that we can be safe. I'm not gonna go into it a ton here. Here's just some charts you can reference, but we will learn more about these exact techniques of communicating in the coming skills slides. But it's very important to memorize these and to use them all the time and very clearly. Okay, so we covered our tools, we covered all the, the things we're gonna use to climb with, and now I will introduce the terrain types, which I like to think as the playground where you're gonna be using all these tools and the skills you're about to learn. So we, we've broken the terrain types into five classes. First class is hiking. Simple walking, simple hiking. Second class is, you know, maybe the terrain is getting a little bit more uneven. You know, you're taking big steps, but nothing too crazy. Third class is simple scrambling. And we will often say that at this point in climbing, you need three points of contact. And when I say three points of contact, I'm referring to my hands and my feet. Like right now, I have two points of contact on the ground. 
So if you can see in the picture, Jesse has three points because the climbing is getting a little bit more, you know, a little more tricky. Next is fourth class. Now that is simple, it's full on scrambling, simple climbing, four points of contact, meaning you, all, you need to have like everything engaged to keep your balance. This kind of climbing often has a lot of exposure and exposure means there's risk of falling and so you'll see the rope come out around this time and we'll start putting protection in. And then fifth class is when the climbing begins in earnest. Now the rope is definitely out, belaying is happening. And if you're unfamiliar with climbing or if you are familiar with climbing, you'll be interested to know that this is where the Yosemite decimal system starts. So you'll have low fifth class and then it jumps to like 5.4, all the way up to like, I think people now are climbing like 5.15. And those numbers just denote the climbing from easier to harder. And so this course and the skills we're about to teach you, imagine they are all gonna be taking place in around the fourth to fifth class terrain and we wanna teach you the base for your skills in order to move safely and efficiently through these types of terrain. So now, Kaylin is gonna take you through some belay skills. Thank you. All right, so now that we've covered the tools and terrain, we get to get to the fun stuff, the actual skills. So we will start with top rope belay. Uh, later we'll do fixed line travel and rappelling. Top rope belay, we break down into top rope belay from below and top rope belay from above. The top rope portion of this is in pr the perspective of the climber. So it just means the rope is going above the climber. The from below or from above portion of the phrase is in reference to the belayer. So the belayer from below means they're on the ground or at the bottom of the route or the bottom of the pitch. Belay from above means that they are at the top of the pitch. Um, they are above the climber. So we'll start with top rope belay from below. Um, this is the most common way that people start climbing. Um, you'll often see this at climbing gyms or at uh, an outdoor climbing area. Here's an overview of what that looks like. So um, we didn't go over, but we will talk about setting up the harness. Um, here we're just showing what the belay action looks like. You can see the belayer there, that's me, um, going over a, using a specific way to belay, which we will talk about later. Another thing is you can't hear, but uh, commands come into play as well. So when Steph gets to the top of the pitch, top of the route, she'll let me know she's ready to come down. Um, and I will communicate back to her. I'm ready to lower her, and then we'll get her back down to the ground. All right, so like I mentioned, um, first step is getting on your harness. Both belayer and climber will need to do this. Um, you are responsible for understanding how your harness works. Um, you wanna make sure when you put it on that there's no twists. I often will end up twisting my uh, leg loops or something like that. So you just wanna be aware of what's going on and making sure you put your harness on properly. Um, you want the harness to fit snugly against you too. You don't want it too loose. Once you have the harness on, um, you wanna set up the belay device as the belayer, which you do by putting your belay device through your belay loop um, on a locking carabiner. And then you'll put the rope, the bite of rope, like we mentioned before, through the belay device, uh, through the carabiner, and make sure that the climbing strand is on top. The climber um, will tie into the, uh, use the rope to tie into their harness, uh, with a rewoven figure eight or a figure eight follow through knot, uh, ensuring that they have enough tail um, at the end so the knot doesn't come undone. So we have a video of how to do this.
I'm going to teach you how to set up your belay device for top rope belay from below. First, I'll take my belay device on a locking carabiner, put it through the belay loop, and then take a bite of rope and push it through one side of the belay device. Then I will take the rope and belay device and push it through the gate of the carabiner and lock the carabiner. Then I'll double check that the climber strand is on top and the brake strand below so I can break down. Today I'm going to teach you how to tie in as a climber. First, I want to make sure that I have enough tail to reweave the figure eight. I'll tie a figure eight on the end of the rope and then put the end of the rope through two hard points of my harness. Pulling the figure eight tight and then reweaving, <clears throat> making sure to keep my knot dressed. I want to make sure that I have enough tail in the end of the rope, which is six to eight inches. I can check that using my hand or by tying a backup knot. Awesome, so now that you've set up your harness, you'll wanna do a safety check with your partner. Um, this basically is just going through what you already did when you set up your device, but telling your partner all of the safety systems that you have in place. First, you'll wanna start by showing your partner that you have your harness on correctly and that your buckles are secure. That's the phrase that we're using because there's multiple ways that a harness can work. And like I mentioned before, as the owner of the harness, it's your responsibility to know how to properly set up your harness. So for me, I have um, a buckle here that's double backed. Some people might have it on both sides and you wanna make sure that they're all set up correctly and tell your partner about it. Um, again, the belayer wants to make sure the belay device is set up with the um, climbing strand on top, the brake strand below, that the rope is going through the belay device and the harness, or in the belay device, or the belay device and the carabiner, um, and that the carabiner is locked. And the climber will show their partner that the rope goes through the two hard points of their harness. They have a rewoven figure eight. I mentioned in the video, um, you want it to be well-dressed, which just means it's, it's tidy. You also want to have the uh, knot as close to your harness as possible and have enough tail at the back there so that the knot doesn't come out. And we have a video of what this might look like. Before we start climbing, we'll do a safety check together. First, I wanna check my harness, that my belt is snug and my buckles are secure. Next, I'll look at my belay setup, make sure that the climber strand comes in on top, goes through my belay device, through the carabiner, and that the carabiner is locked. Kaylin, my harness is snug, the belt is snug, and the buckles are secure. I am through two hard points. I have a figure eight that is well-dressed that is close to my harness with an adequate tail. All right, so after you have set up and done safety checks, you'll wanna start the climbing by actually using some commands. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, we have specific commands that we use that mean specific things. Um, so you want to go through those and use them as often as possible, um, well, in really every situation. It may seem kind of silly uh, when you're standing right next to each other, thinking, why do I have to say all of these words? Um, but there might be reasons that your climbing partner isn't ready to climb that you don't know, so saying um, these commands will help communicate that clearly. And then in a situation where maybe you can't hear as well, um, it's easier if you have the words down and you know maybe what they would be saying. Another thing to note is that you wanna use your partner's name as much as possible. Again, it may seem silly when you're in the gym or something like that, um, but when you're out in areas with a lot of people or even at the gym, it can be hard to, to hear and you think that the person next to you said something um, but it's actually, you know, your belayer or your climber. So using names will help um, mitigate that confusion. 
And then once you've started the commands, the climber will start climbing, and the belayer will start belaying. And this is the action that they will use. We use the mnemonic PBUS, which stands for pull, break, under, and slide, um, to remember the actions that we need to do for belaying. And the first thing you're gonna do is pull the rope through the belay device and immediately move into the break position, that third photo there. The reason for this is because the second photo is one of the most exposed positions for the belayer and the climber to be in. If the, belay, or if the climber were to fall at that point, um, it would be more difficult for the belayer to catch that fall um, and to get into the break position. So we avoid being in that position as much as possible and do that by breaking immediately after pulling the rope. And then you bring your top hand um, down to match your other hand at the brake strand. Uh, so you're holding on to the brake strand as you slide your brake hand back up to the belay device to repeat the motion over again. And the reason that we do this is that there is a national standard by the American Alpine Club that we follow um, and PBUS is a way to adhere to that standard. The three key elements of the standard is that you maintain your hand on the brake strand at all times, which uh, we just illustrated we do. Um, you have hand transitions in the position of maximum friction. And the other point here, which may seem weird, but um, you wanna be positioned ergonomically. The reason for this is because it, it takes a long time to climb. And if you're in a position when you're belaying that is not comfortable, you could tire and lose your technique, um, which puts both the climber and the belayer at risk. So here's a video of putting it all together. Kaylin, that's me. Andy, blaze on. Kaylin, climbing. Andy, climb on. So you'll notice when Andy fell, I was able to catch her fall easily because I was in the brake position, um, had the brake strand in my brake hand, um, and even though I didn't know when she was going to fall, I was able to catch her. Andy, gotcha. Caitlin, lower. Andy, lowering. Off the leg. Andy Belay is off. So that is it for top rope belay from below. Now we will get into top rope belay from above. And in the Mazamas, um, you'll see this used when we're trying to get lots of people through a rock pitch um, or a steeper section of a climb. You might have one person belay uh, from above after another um, multiple times, or potentially if you have a fixed line put in, then the last climber will need to be belayed up. This often happens on a peak like Unicorn Peak which is a fun climb that you can do once you graduate. So here's an overview of what that looks like. It may be difficult to see, but Steph is up at the top of the pitch or the top of the route. Um, she has an anchor behind her that she is attached to that we'll talk about in the next slide and she is belaying in a very similar 
way as we did with Belay from Below, but instead she's having her brake strand coming up because the climbing strand is going down. All right, so um, the first thing we do is get set up for top rope belay from above. Um, this is different because the climber and the belayer are not in the same location. Um, it's assumed that, the, um, that, that both of you have already put on your harness, or at least the belayer has put on their harness. So we'll just focus on the belayer uh, for this section. They should have the harness on. Um, and then the first things that you want to do to get set up is clip into the anchor in two points. Uh, Steph talked about this earlier in the anchor section. You want to clip one piece of protection, either your personal leash or the clove, into the master point and the other piece into the shelf. Uh, next, you'll want to get positioned. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and then once you get positioned, you will set up your belay device similar to how we did for top rope belay from below, but this time the climber strand is going down, so your brake strand is going up. So positioning, we use the acronym ABC, which stands for Anchor Belayer Climber. The reason you want to be aligned in this position, or what this means is you want to be in a line between those three points um, to make sure that the belayer does not get pulled out of position when um, the climber weights the rope, either from a fall or from being lowered. The diagram on the left side of the screen, the upper portion is all good uh, positioning. The far right, the upper right, actually shows uh, belay from below. In that situation, you definitely want to be aligned as well. But in belay from above, it becomes more important um, because the belayer is uh, up at the top of the pitch next to the anchor, the climber below, and it's easier to get pulled off as the belayer. Another thing you want to think about um, with ABC is making sure that your personal protections are tight. This will help in figuring out uh, where you need to be positioned and making sure that if uh, the climber does uh, weight the rope in some way, um, there isn't a bunch of slack in your system that um, will then pull you more than they would be than it would if you were tight. So here's a video of setup and ABC. I am going to teach you how to set up for a top rope belay at the top of a pitch. First thing I'm going to do is clip in my two personal protections. In the Mazamas, we like to use two for redundancy. I have my first one here on the shelf, I'm going to make sure that carabiner is locked. And then I have my clove down here on the master point, make sure that carabiner is locked and my knot is tied right. Next thing I'm going to do is put myself into position to bring up my climber. I'm going to use the ABC acronym. A for anchor, B for belayer, C for climber. I'm gonna go ahead, once I got that, I'm gonna throw my belay device on my belay loop. Bring up all this slash until I find my climber. I like to keep my belay ledge nice and tidy, so I'm gonna move all this stuff over here. Now when you set up your belay device, you wanna make sure that your brake strand is on top and your climber strand is on the bottom so you can break up. Make sure that carabiner is locked. And I'm going to go ahead and move my hand to the front of this so I don't get pinched in case my climber falls and I'm ready to go. All right, so as we did before, after you get set up, you want to do a safety check. This, again, is different. You won't necessarily be telling someone about your safety checks um, like we did with belay from below. Your partner's right there. 
In this situation, um, especially during BCEP, you will likely have another person at the top of the pitch or as the climber at the bottom of the pitch to double check your gear. But um, getting in the habit of doing it yourself will be really helpful too. So you wanna start actually with your harness. Um, we don't have photos of that. It's assumed that the harness is on, but sometimes um, you could loosen your harness or make adjustments before you get set up for this. So you just wanna double check that the harness is back to where you want it to be for the bling. Then of course, you'll wanna check your personal protections that you are in the master point and the shelf, which again is one strand of each leg of the anchor and that those carabiners are locked. Then you wanna check your positioning with ABC, um, make sure that those protection leashes are tight, and then set up your belay device, making sure the rope is running through the belay device and the carabiner, that the carabiner is locked, and the climbing strand goes down and the brake strand is up. And again, you'll use the same commands as you did for top rope belay from below. Um, the only difference here is that the belayer, when the climber gets up to the uh, top of the route, if they are not being lowered down, the climber or the belayer will tell the climber where to climb up to and then where to clip in on the anchor. Um, they might prefer you to clip on to the shelf or the master point, um, or it might be a different type of anchor that has a different anatomy, and the belayer will be responsible for telling the climber where that is. So we have a video. Oh, not quite. <laughs> um, so the action is we call P-boss instead of P-bus, again, to remember the actions that you take. This time it's pull, break, over, slide because the uh, positioning is different. You're breaking up this way, so you want to slide your other hand off um, up above your brake strand, brake hand, um, before sliding down to the belay device. Here's our video of what that looks like, all put together. So you'll notice Steph did a really good job of making sure that um, she was really ready to belay me once I said that's me. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, you can be anxious or oh I have to you know I have to start belaying now because the climber is ready. But it's more beneficial, safer as the belayer to make sure to take that extra time that your belay area is clear, that your belay device is really set up properly. Um, before you say belay is on. And as the climber, uh, you want to make sure you wait to hear that the climb, that belay is ready. All right, Kaylin, when you climb up here, if you could tap out on my right, your left, that would be great. Go ahead and clip your personal protection into the shelf right here. Okay, so off the leg. Lays off. All right, that is it for our top rope belay. Now Steph is going to get into fixed line travel and rappelling. Okay, fixed line travel. What is fixed line travel? It's essentially a tool, a technique that we use traveling on a rope in a more technical terrain. Um, if you're wondering what technical terrain is, um, if you think back to the terrain types we just talked about, I would consider anything 
where you know you're starting to have to think more to be more you know cognizant of where you are how you're using your hands three to four points of contact we're using this type of rope to travel in more like fourth low fifth class terrain and we also are using this form of travel uh, when the exposure is significant. So think like maybe the climbing might not be that difficult. You know, you scrambled you around on rocks, you're thinking low, low fifth, but the fall is significant. The danger is uh, significant. So we like to protect this bit of climbing. Um, and then it's also very efficient for moving large groups. So a fixed line, it means it's fixed. The rope is already there. So you can imagine if you had a team of 12, if you had to belay every person, it would be very time consuming and sometimes speed is safety in the mountains. So fixed line travel is a nice way to get a lot of people through technical terrain. You can, um, it's essentially like, I'll get into it a little bit more, but it's like a hand line from one end of your climb to the other. And it's on the wall, stuck on the wall, and you use it to travel vertically, you can use it to traverse, or um, if your descent route is the same as your ascent route, you can use it to come down. So the structure essentially is you have two anchors on either end of this section you're climbing, and then there's a rope that is stretched between the two anchors. And then along that rope, you have pieces of protection into the climbing surface, and the rope is attached to those pieces of protection with a non-locking carabiner, and those are there to hold the rope to the climbing surface and to hold the rope on the um, route that you've picked. And the way that we, you, you use it as a climber is that you are going to take uh, that cordage that you got, and now when you go to the MMC, you're going to be cutting what we like to call a prusik cord. Um, it's like a loop of cord, and you take that prusik cord and you attach yourself to that fixed rope with a prusik hitch, which would be attached to your belay loop with a locking carabiner. So here is a little bit of information on that prusik hitch. This one. Um, it's very important that you dress this one just right. And um, I like to use a lot of stories with my knots and a lot of visuals. So you know, you'll know you've dressed it right if you see six donuts and a banana. So I like to think of that. And um, then what you do essentially is you move, the, this, uh, this hitch is kind of cool because you can move it, it slides. So you slide it along that rope and then if you were to fall or trip or whatever, it immediately grips the rope and cinches so you wouldn't go anywhere, you wouldn't fall. So it makes the climbing very safe. Now the tricky bit is when you're moving this Prusik hitch along the rope, you have to get it past those intermediate pieces of protection without letting the rope come out of the carabiner. And so here are, are a couple pictures of the action of that, making sure that you don't, you get yourself to the other side, but you don't let the rope come out of the carabiner because that would be really bad. Um, it's, this is another skill that we are just presenting to you. You can use these resources to look back on, but you need to practice this. And of course, you will get a ton of practice with it out on your hikes, at Horse Thief, and then hopefully when you are out on a climb this summer with the club. All right, time to learn about rappelling. This is our last big skill of the night. This one is very important. It is used to come down from the mountains you've just climbed up. You know, it's sometimes you can scramble down, but, but you know, the terrain might become too technical that that is not an option. And so we use rappelling to safely get down out of the mountains. And uh, in case you're not familiar with this term or what this looks like, here's a quick overview of what it looks like. Yep, just sliding down the wall. That's all it is. Boop. <laughs> so, first things first, we need an anchor. So these rappelling anchors are a little bit different than the climbing anchors in that a lot of times we take our climbing anchors with us later, but these stay behind. You um, 
they're, and they're, they're uh, different depending on where you are. If you're climbing in the alpine, they might often be something slung around a natural, like a natural piece of protection. You'll see webbing with wrap rings. Again, these are all weird terms to write them down, ask later if you're unfamiliar. Or if you're at a crag or maybe a more popular alpine location, there will be bolts which have chains or wrap rings which you'll attach your rope to. So setting up to repel. The first thing that you wanna do is clip two pieces of personal protection into each anchor point in whatever type of anchor you're repelling off of. Now, if you watch the repelling video that we made in its entirety, which I highly recommend, I will show you two different ways to do that. And um, so first, you do that. Next, you're gonna set up your auto block hitch. And then third, you're gonna set up your repel device. So you're probably wondering what the auto block hitch is for. So we're gonna take a little time out and talk about repel backups. So in the club, we use two types of repel backups regularly. And what a repel backup is, it, it's like an extra break, an extra bit of safety in case for whatever reason something happens and you let go you're not gonna go anywhere. It just makes it really safe and more comfortable. So the first type of repel backup is a firefighter belay. And what that is is that you will have somebody on the ground at the bottom of the repel holding the rope for you, ready to add friction in case you let go or get nervous or whatever. And then the auto block hitch is something that you set up yourself on your harness. It will act as um, you know, it's a hitch, so it cinches the rope, so if something were to happen, it will catch you. It'll act as almost a third break hand, is what we like to call it. And you attach that to your, the leg loop of your harness. And I have a video here that will show you how to set up for a pal and also set this piece of equipment up, which is a requirement in this course, so I encourage you to practice and really get the hang of this. you how to set up for a repel at the top of a pitch, repelling on a single strand of rope and using an auto block as a repel backup. First thing I'm going to do is clip my personal protection leashes into the anchor. This time I've used two leashes, one into each of the anchor points. Next thing I'm going to do is set up my auto block hitch. Now I'm going to go ahead and clip mine to the inside of my leg loop so that it won't interfere with my belt buckle. Now to tie this hitch, you simply wrap your piece of cordage, or in this case I have a hollow block, around the rope three to four times. I'm going to do four since this rope is quite thin. Make sure that it is working. I'm going to pull up on the rope and it catches. So next I'm going to set up my repel device. Make sure that the rope goes through the carabiner. All right, so now we're gonna... Okay, a couple quick notes on that. The um, auto block hitch, the piece of cordage, you guys can work on building those at the MMC, just like uh, I mentioned earlier with the Prusik loops. And also, because you're attaching it to your leg loop, I want you to make sure that you check with your instructors, get to know your harness, have them look at your harness, and they will help you find the best place to hook that up because all harnesses are different and there's certain buckles you don't want them to interfere with. Okay, so the next step in repelling. In the Mazamas, we have this clever little acronym that we've come up with, and it's a series of steps to help you verify that your repel setup is correct, uh, which is very important. You want to make sure that you're safe. I still, to this day, run through this little acronym in my head every time I repel. I have a video coming up that walks you through these steps, but there's a couple things I want to point out. One is that though the R is for repel device and there's only an R, you really want to, you want to add your auto block hitch backup check at this point. So I always go repel backup right in a row. And another one I want to quick mention, in case because this might not be familiar to you, is that the K is for knots in the end of your rope. So you might be wondering, why do I need knots at the end of my rope? Well, whether you're repelling on one strand or two, whatever it is, they need to have knots at the end, because this will close the system, 
which will prevent you from accidentally sliding off the end of your rope, which would be bad. And um, by doing that, by making that a habit, you will avoid probably the most common repelling accident that happens. So make sure that you make that a habit, an every single time habit. I would super appreciate that. Zamas, we use the acronym BARC as a checklist to verify our repel setup. So the B in BARC is for your belt and buckles. I'm going to make sure that my buckles are double backed. My belt is nice and tight. A is for anchors. Just going to double check and make sure everything looks good. Make sure that your rope is attached and whatever hardware you're using is blocked. R is for repel device. I'm going to make sure that the rope is going through the repel device, around the carabiner, that carabiner is locked, and through my belay loop. The K is for knots. I want to be sure that there are knots at the end of my rope to close this system and that the rope is on the ground. Now that I've verified my repel setup, I'm ready to repel. To do that, I'm going to weight the system. I'm going to choke up, make sure that the my weight is on my repel device, which is on my harness, not on my personal protection leech. Once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and take my pro out. Double check that my firefighter belay repel backup is ready, and I'm ready to repel. Okay, so you've done your safety checks, you've weighted your system, you're ready to repel. There are commands for repelling, but they're super simple. You're pretty much just signifying to your team that you're on repel, so before you start heading down, you're gonna yell on repel, and then when you get to the ground, once you take your auto block off and you take the rope out of your repel device, you're gonna yell off repel, which tells the other team members that they can come on down, you're off the rope. And so a couple things to keep in mind while you're repelling is you always want to maintain that brake hand. Even though you, if you have an auto block, don't get into bad habits, still maintain that brake hand, super important. And um, move with control. And keep, if you think about keeping your feet wide, you know, like a tripod, walk down the wall. You know, sometimes I will take uh, my, my like non-dominant hand or whatever in case the, the rock gets a little bit jumbly or there's a roof, you wanna brace yourself. That's totally okay, I do that all the time. And um, I have a last video of repelling that puts it all together, but I just wanted to make one note about the video. It's a series of different types of repels that you will encounter, whether in the mountains this summer or in the class. They're all just slight variations of the same technique using different backups, different rope configurations. So um, you should watch all of them, watch it all the way through. It gets a bit repetitive, but you know, re repetition is good. You gotta build up muscle memory. Make sure you memorize all these steps, get in your system. So just, yeah, watch it over and over again. So here is the big picture. Now I'm going to teach you how to repel on two strands of rope, again using the auto block as your repel backup. So the first thing we're going to do is set up our auto block, again, on the inside of your leg loop to avoid interfering with this buckle. Now this time we have two strands of rope instead of one, so I'm only going to use three wraps and I'm also going to be very careful to wrap both strands of rope. Go ahead and pull up on that and make sure that it catches. And then next I'm gonna put my repel device on. Making sure that you insert both strands of rope through your repel device and through the carabiner. Now we're ready to check our repel setup using bark. My buckles are double backed. Harness is nice and tight. Anchor looks good. The rope is through the hardware. Hardware is locked. My repel device is the rope going both strands through the repel device around the carabiner. Carabiner is locked through my belay loop. Auto block is through the leg loop. Grabbing both strands and the carabiner is locked. 
I have knots in the end of my rope to close the system and the rope is on the ground. Now that we've checked our rappel setup, we are ready to rappel, so I'm going to weight the system. Making sure I also remember to choke up on my auto block and again, at least a hand's distance between your auto block and your rappel device. And we are ready to go. One quick note before I, I go ahead and hand the next slide off to Kalen is um, this rappel that I just did with the double strand and the auto block, this is what you guys are going to be tested on at the end of the class. So please watch all the variations, but this is the one they're going to want to see for your test. All right, we are almost done. Uh, we made it through all of the skills, and so now we're going to uh, talk about just some fundamentals of climbing movement. Here's a list here of things that you want to think about when you're climbing, but for me, a few things um, I think about or like to note is uh, to use your feet. A lot of people think that climbers uh, are, have big muscular upper bodies, and some do, um, but those of us that don't have that can be great climbers as well. Um, another thing to consider is breathing. It might seem very simple, but it's easy to get anxious up on the wall and you end up holding your breath, um, not noticing that you're doing it. So if you're able to breathe in, just relax, it helps with um, keeping your focus wide, taking a step back and maybe seeing holds that you didn't see before. So with that in mind, um, I'd like you to just think about what you notice that's different between these two photos. What I see is on the left photo, the climber um, has their arms close into the wall. That's something we call T-Rex arms. Um, and feet kind of close together and hips away from the wall, having to use uh, the hands more on the wall. On the right photo, I see long arms, which uh, help reduce fatigue. Um, the feet are a little bit wider apart and on better holds, and the hips are in, which means the weight is more over the feet, um, which will help by using those feet and reducing fatigue in your arms. So here is a list of resources that we have for you. Um, it includes all the videos that we showed today, plus some additional resources that can be found in your handbook as well. And that is it. So thank you very much. We're excited to get started um, and can't wait to see you out there. <laughs>